So what about some, earlier we were kind of joking a little bit about the atelectasis versus infiltrates thing. And you know, chest imaging is a, you know, we have to, cons we are consumers of chest imaging reports. We're consumers of surgical reports. Those ones we were just talking about, you know, I want to get in there and see what they did. Especially things like esophagectomy, you know, you kind of know, but things like head and neck resections where, or any cancer resection that might involve structures that could be affected, you know, that assist with swallowing, uh, those operations are not planned. They kind of go in there and figure out where the disease is and then they start cutting it out based on where it is now, but they can't always predict how many, how big the margins are going to be. Esophagectomy is a little different. So surgical reports. But consuming the medical record and then the evidence that supports what's going on in the medical record is crucial. I think that really boosts our value uh, in the team. And, and like I said at the beginning, I think physicians are consulting us to figure stuff out. You know, they're not, sent to, they're not doing a prescription for exercise like they do with the um, occupational or physical therapist. They're saying, this patient has a problem. I don't know what to do about it. You fix it. Can you figure out what it is and how to fix it? Usually physicians to other therapists, and that's why I don't like using the word therapist to describe what we do, because we're diagnosing and treating. Usually physicians already made the diagnosis, and so they're prescribing to other therapists. I think what we do is much more diagnostic, um, and so therefore I, I think um, that's what they're asking us to do. Figure it out. Um, but understanding their language is really important, so that's, that's what this is about. The reason I'm showing this, this is from the Centers for Disease Control, and all they're doing is putting up a figure showing all of the things that go into healthcare-associated pneumonia. So here's the pneumonia down here, and here are all the risk factors up here, and check it out, there's aspiration, that little tiny thing right there, and there's oropharyngeal colonization, that even tinier thing right there. The mechanism of aspiration because of dysphagia as a cause of healthcare-associated pneumonia is teeny-weeny. Okay. And so I'm, I'm trying to put the, I'm not trying to say aspiration pneumonia is unimportant. What I'm trying to communicate is that it is important, but it's not as important as it's made to be. And, and there are a lot of other causes. And if we zero in on this like a laser beam and we forget about all of these other risk factors, contaminated respiratory therapy equipment, cross-colonization by healthcare workers, ventilator circuits that were contaminated. How many of you have ever, oh, I'm starting to rant now, how many of you have ever gotten a consult from a patient who's just been extubated in the ICU and they're diagnosed with aspiration pneumonia? They say, oh, this guy has a right lower lobe infiltrate. We, we just extubated him 10 minutes ago. You gotta see him now. And I'm going, well, like, what diet did you have him on while he was on the vent? <laughs> you see, you know, so I mean, right? So there, there's, there are logic things that we need to just back up because we get kind of balled up when they, when they, the doctor wants me to do this and they say, no, they gave us a consult. And that means they want us to figure this out. They didn't tell me to do anything. And we got to just sit back and go through the information. Nobody gets aspiration pneumonia while they're on the vent. Dysphagia related aspiration pneumonia. People who are heavily sedated, who have an invasive device in their airway, you betcha they're gonna aspirate saliva through the cuff. Yep, that's not, I can't fix that. Head rotation, let's start with one that's really kinda of easy to understand and, and we've all seen it before. Head rotation postures, this is designed to uh, divert a bolus to the opposite side to which the head was rotated, right? So you rotate the head to the right, bolus is diverted to the left. By the way, use the term rotation, that's an anatomical term. Everybody who took anatomy understands rotation. When we say turn, head turn, it's ambiguous, it, you know, is it, some people call this a head turn. Um, and so um, it's important to use anatomical terms so we're all speaking the same language. It was first developed by Logeman and her group uh, back in the 80s to compensate for unilateral pharyngeal paresis. And for that purpose, it was really good. Later on, studies have shown, so we're taking it up to 2012, that head rotation actually increases upper esophageal sphincter opening diameter. All you do is turn your head and you, oh, there I did it. Rotate your head and the UES opens bigger. Yep. Uh, it also decreases UES pressure, advantageous for the suction part of the bolus flow through the UES. It increases interbolus pressure in the pharynx because it narrows the pharynx from two halves to one half. 
Boyle's law, you have the same amount of pushing force through a smaller tube, you get more pressure. Three for one. Uh, so that's a pretty good outcome. You get three extra bonus points, bonus treatments for doing one thing. Here's an example. This is a patient who came in with a globus sensation. My throat is really tight. I can't, uh, I have a hard time swallowing. It won't go down. I have to swallow multiple times. It's really uncomfortable, blah, blah, blah. No stroke, no neurological disease, none of these things. And head rotation would not ordinarily be selected for a patient with globus, right? So watch this. So here's the initial swallows in the neutral position to get the baseline. Notice the narrow UES opening. Notice the multiple swallows. Notice the struggling behaviors. The head movement, the body English, and all of these things. The patient now is talking. It's stuck. It's stuck. We're... So what do we do? What do you think that is right there? It's her finger. Good trick. Point to where you feel it with your finger and then turn on the x-ray. Because some people actually say, I can feel it stuck right there. And using x-ray for biofeedback can be very powerful. Look, there's you pointing. There's nothing there. What do you say next? There might be something down here, though. You should see another doctor about that, right? All the stuff we did earlier today. That's the referred symptom right there, possibly. And in fact, at the end of this case, that's exactly what we did. We said, well, we made you feel better, but we still don't know what the problem is. All right, so she's pointing right there, and we can see there's really nothing going on. There's no residue. It doesn't mean that the UES isn't closed too tightly, which could be from an esophageal problem or something else. All right, but that's not the point here. Let's see what the head rotation did for this young lady. So now she'll rotate her head to, I can't remember which side, but as it turned out, it didn't matter. Either side was the same. Head rotation, she's not swallowing it. I'll pull her into the field in just a moment and watch the caliber of UES opening right now. Right? That's all we did. And look, she swallowed once. She's going, wow, that was, I just did that and it was that? Let me do it again. And boom. Magic. So some things were designed for one thing, but actually can do other things that are also advantageous for our patients. And you know, I guess the problem with stasis in the esophagus is the retrograde flow back into the pharynx. You know, think about it. If a bolus gets into but not out of the esophagus and then courses back up into the pharynx, it hasn't been acidified by the stomach yet, right? And so technically, if that material gets aspirated, it's going to look just like it came from the mouth. So, so uh, excuse me, um, severe dysmotility should always be considered a possible source of aspiration in people who have known aspiration syndromes, um, especially if that person doesn't have a disease that causes oropharyngeal dysphagia because this would be an unexplained aspiration pneumonia, and it would not be a chemical pneumonitis type pneumonia because there are no gastric contents in it. You follow what I'm saying? If material gets into the esophagus, stays in the esophagus, and then is aspirated, it's going to look just like it came straight from the mouth. Because of skeletal changes in aging, there's a higher prevalence of osteophytes and things that are close to but not completely obstructing epiglottic inversion in the old person. Uh, the, I don't know how well you can see that x-ray on the top right there, but that person's epiglottis is touching the posterior pharyngeal wall. And you can bet your bottom dollar before that three millimeter plate was put in there, it wasn't touching it. Now, it was still close, but you see the difference is that the older person has less wiggle room. And so the three millimeter plate just occupied that space, and this is a person who, when they swallowed, their epiglottis couldn't flip down, couldn't invert. Um, and so that's an example of, of this. And that's only a two-level fusion, uh, fusion. In the next sequence now, let me wait until we get up to the neck. Now what we see is he's in the opposite position. Now the airway is on our left, the esophagus is in the middle, and the vertebrae are, are on our right. So the patient has gone from a left posterior oblique position to lying down on the table aiming the other direction. Okay, so now we've eliminated gravity. All of those images up till now were done with the upright position. Now the patient's lying down, and you're gonna see individual boluses. The patient draws them up from the straw, swallows once. This guy had a hard time swallowing once, so we actually had to help him with that by, we said, uh, take the bolus in your mouth, and then we removed the, the tech removed the straw. Swallow and then open your mouth and breathe through your mouth. 
So he couldn't swallow again because he was breathing through his mouth. All right, so here we go. So bolus number one, there it is. And so you see she, the radiologist keeps the camera focused on the tail of the bolus because that's where propulsion occurs. And notice that that bolus separated. Some of it went down, some of it went up and stayed up. Okay, that was really cool also because you could see the diaphragm. So when we get to the distal esophagus, watch the, the position of the diaphragm and its motion. And notice that when it descends, the barium stops flowing, like right there, and ascend, descend, ascend, descend. So there's the action of the curl diaphragm uh, lower esophageal sphincter fibers. Here's another bolus, and you can see this. So this is escape of the primary peristaltic contraction. Here you see stasis in the proximal third of the esophagus. You see some peristalsis distal to that, and then propulsion of the distal esophagus, but this is what's giving him the symptoms. So there are some telltale signs. To, you know, people have shoulders, and the shoulders in some people are right in the, at the plane of the hypopharynx. And you know, sure, the hypopharynx rises up into the field in most people well enough to look at the anatomy, but not always. And so very often, it's only the very top or proximal part of the defect that we can see during video fluoroscopy, during ordinary oropharyngeal exams. Um, but there are some telltale signs on video fluoroscopy that might make one say, hmm, I better go look down there for that. Uh, the bottom line is detecting them in the lateral view is not the gold standard, but if there's a suspicion that there is one there, an anterior posterior view is the way to go. But there are some telltale signs. Number one, when we first turned on the x-ray for this case, first thing we noticed was this little air pocket here. Um, and then the rest of the area around it is not white air-filled area. What's going on here is and, and this just gave us the suspicion enough to look for the zanker. What's going on here is there's a big defect here, and this gray area below the air is literally, you know, the patient's latest meal, you know, residue of that um, sitting in there. And there's a fluid air level there. We can see the air sitting on top of the fluid. And so uh, number one telltale sign, if we see an air fluid level at the, at the level of the UES, either before or during barium administration, that's telltale sign number one. <clears throat> second telltale sign, and all of these will be, in, excuse me, illustrated in the video in a sec. Second telltale sign is after the swallow, the hypopharynx is clean of barium, but during the subsequent swallow, we see a little dark barium rising up into the field during the swallow and then disappears off the field um, because the shoulders are in the way. So a, a, a volume of residue is kind of peaking up and then getting back out of the way. Um, and then the third one is unexplained piriform sinus residue. So the typical pattern there is at the end of the swallow, you turn the video off, you have your freeze frame up there, you see nice empty piriform sinuses, you flip the video on, video on for the next bolus, and the piriform sinuses are full of barium. The mistake that a lot of clinicians make is they say, oh, well, it must have come from the mouth. Well, yeah, it might have, but I didn't see it, so I don't know. So next video, so if you don't know, during the next bolus, turn the fluoro on a couple seconds earlier while the person is putting the bolus into their mouth to see if it's coming from the mouth, because in some cases it's coming from below. What's happening is the barium is squirting back out of the defect upward when the video, when the fluoro's off. And I just want to really kind of underscore the role of the speech pathologist in the management of people with uh, tracheostomies. On the left is the process of weaning. The process of weaning begins with obviously an acute illness, respiratory failure, and then the patient survives, and they fail to wean from mechanical ventilation through oral tracheal tubes, so they undergo placement of a tracheostomy. Inadver I mean, uh, invariably, most people who are switched to tracheostomies wean almost instantaneously because the tracheostomy tube is relatively frictionless. Uh, and the person doesn't have to pull air through the narrow, tiny nooks and crannies of the upper airway and mouth. Uh, and then eventually the person is, patient is decannulated. We have a whole big process of what we do with people who have tracheostomies, including first seeing if they tolerate the cuff deflation, screening to see if oral pharyngeal secretions are aspirated, making sure that air can get around the tube and the cuff into the mouth and nose. Uh, and then, um, you know, using an occlusive device to restore expiratory airway flow and pressure. We start seeing if we can get people eating without aspirating, and then at the end we want to, and I, I hope everybody's involved in this part too, but at the end, we don't just walk away when they tolerate a one-way valve, we, we should walk away when they can tolerate a two-way valve. 
that is complete occlusion. That's the end point in my book um, because that restores airway function. Then they can be decannulated. So we have a lot of steps to do, but the point is that our steps really just fit in right tiny into that tiny little spot between the last two steps of the weaning process. So we're not just doing swallow of valves and one-way valve of valves and getting people talking and getting people eating. We're using swallowing and talking to manipulate the weaning process. Have you ever, how, have, you've all seen the look on your patient's face when you pop on the valve or you put your finger on the first time and you say, tell me your name, and they hear their voice for the first time. Pretty cool stuff, right? Use it. That is heavily motivating, and that will distract the person from some of the discomfort of going through the process of, towards decannulation. It's a great thing, but it's not our goal. It's an objective. The goal is decannulation. And so if we keep that in mind, we're part of a bigger process, I think it really underscores the role, our role in the weaning process. We're not there for talking and swallowing. We use talking and swallowing and work with those, but we're part of this whole big restoring ventilatory function process. Uh, likewise, the EMST devices uh, and any kind of resistive expiratory and inspiratory exercise have been shown to produce good outcomes in increasing expiratory flow rates, expiratory pressures. Both of those relate directly to cough pressure uh, and force of cough, which relates directly to airway clearance, mucociliary clearance, reaction to aspiration. You know, if, if you have a patient who's gonna aspirate and they say, I'm gonna aspirate and I don't care what you say, this is a great idea. In, it, boosting the reserve of pulmonary function will be a huge benefit to that person when they get an aspiration syndrome. Um, I mean, anytime a patient has unexplained pharyngeal symptoms, and, and what I mean by unexplained is after doing a full oral pharyngeal workup and everything is done, and there's still no explanation for it, 100% of those people need to be referred for evaluation of esophageal structure and function, period. Because there's so many of those referred symptoms that are known to be associated with esophageal pathology. So I would say that's, so I agree with you, um, uh, but I don't right in my head have the list of the different ones that lead to cough. Um, Anyway, so start counting the coughs when you walk in the door, because if, if it's happening when they're not eating and drinking, it's kind of hard to make it. Everyone will say, oh, well, it's their saliva. Well, I don't know about you, but most of my patients have zero stomia when I go in the door. So, um, you know, think about that and start counting as soon as you walk in the door and then do the math. You'll be surprised at how happy those numbers make you feel. It is so reassuring to have numbers when you walk out the door. Can pulmonary diseases cause dysphagia? Sure. Swallow respiratory coordination in CHF is a great example. I call that acute reversible dysphagia. And it's really different from chronic static dysphagia, like after stroke, for instance. They're totally different phenomena because one, when the disease goes away, the problem goes away. One isn't going away. And so the management plans are very, very different. 